So last time we introduced the idea of regression as trying to find the trend of a data set. You come up with a model curve. Last time we did regression for a straight line. We regressed the data to a straight line. That was the model curve. And that model curve, according to regression, minimizes the sum of the square of the errors between itself and the input data points. And I asked you over that lecture to derive the equations that govern the parameters that reduce that error and the parameters in that curve. So those parameters were the coefficients for that model curve. Last time they were A0 and A1, right? Because our model curve was A1x plus A0. The equations we derived that govern those coefficients, so we solve those equations for the coefficients, we get the coefficients, plug them back into the curve, that curve minimizes that sum of the square of the errors. Those equations are called the normal equations, okay? The normal equations. There's a reason why they call them that. We'll, we'll get to that a little later in the semester. However, what you need to keep in mind is that the normal equations are not the equations for a straight line fit only. Any regression fit, when you go ahead, plug in the model curve, it could have a thousand parameters in it or seven parameters, okay? Once you plug in that model curve into the sum of the squares and differentiate that sum of the squares with respect to all of the parameters and set it equal to zero, those equations, when you set that, those derivatives equal to zero, those are the normal equations. So far, our normal equations were linear in the parameters or the coefficients of the curve. But at the end of this chapter, we're going to also derive a nonlinear version of those for nonlinear regression models. Those will also call them, we will also call them the normal equations. Okay? This is a definition here. The normal equations are simply the equations, whether linear or nonlinear, that govern the parameters of a least squares regression. These are the equations for regression to a straight line. Okay? But we could derive those for any kind of model and curve fit. We're going to explore different models um, in the next uh, few lectures. But today, I'm going to take a step back and do some error analysis to understand how well our straight line or our regression model is going to fit the data. Um, so far, we know how to do a regression to a straight line. So at least we have one way of doing regression. And if you remember last time, we had those data points for the height versus femur. And we plot, we drew the line, and it looked good, right? It looked okay. It passed through the data. It represented the trend. But that's only a qualitative assessment of um, how well that straight line represents the data. Today, we're going to dig a little bit more deeper um, to get some quantitative assessment. And I am going to start with something you probably heard, you probably know of, called standard deviation. And I hope to explain it to you in a different way then you have learned it, or you've probably n learned of this way, which is great. It will only reinforce the idea. But if you know about this and um, learn something, in a new way to interpret standard deviation, that'd be great. So in general, consider n data points. So that capital N is going to carry with us through the uh, rest of the slides today. Um, n data points given to you, xi and yi, yi is the response variable, xi is the independent variable. Um, for example, consider the femur length and height data that we looked at last time, okay? I have whatever, 10 data points in this case, but n, any, n, this applies to any n number of data points. Now, if I come and present you with data, forget anything you know about the femur height or et cetera. I mean, I'm giving you data. What is the most basic metric that you could use to tell me about those data? Clearly, you're not going to tell me, oh, the height of the person with the femur length of 40 centimeters is going to be 163, 41 is going to be 165. I need one number, one quantity 
the simplest quantity you could think of in the absence of any other information about anything in the world. You have a set of data, you're giving it to me. What single value, what single number you can tell me that kind of summarizes the data? The mean. The mean. Why? Because it's easy. Yeah. Okay. Easy. Think about it. What number would you give me that could represent the data without doing any other, without knowing any other thing about the data set? The simplest quantity that you could use to represent a data or to tell me about the data is the average. The average for the exam in this class was that much, right? The average height, the average age, the average GPA, everywhere. The average or the mean value is the simplest statistic that you could provide given any set of data. That's the first thing we do. It's, it's natural, it's comprehensive. It kind of represents on average where everybody falls, right? That's great. I like that. So I agree. The average or the mean value is the simplest metric you can get from a data set. The mean value is simply the sum of all the response variables, think about the average grade on an exam. We sum up all the grades, you know, 50, 70, 68, 76, etc., and divide by the total number of students. Same thing applies for any data set. It's the sum of all the response va variables, excuse me, divided by the total number of data points. We call that Y bar. In many ways, the mean value is held as the gold standard, as a, as a gold standard through which we can compare data to other data. Okay? We'll see what that means. Now, for this specific data set, I'm just going to want to show some numbers here. The average height of the individual for all of those femur lengths that we've collected is 167.8 centimeters. I added all the heights and divided by the number of data points which were 10. Okay? Perfect. Now, the mean value, if you draw a horizontal line, the mean value, okay, it divides the data, not in the middle, because that's not the median, okay, divides the data with data above it and data below it. Agreed? We're not talking about the median, we're talking about the mean. The median divides the data in half, 50% above it, 50% below it. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in the actual response variable. The mean value, if you draw a line, splits the data, some data above it, and some data below it. Now, what I have here, the mean value, okay. Now, when you compare to this blue line, the distribution, the scatter of the data, it's called the spread of the data around the mean. Okay, you've probably heard of that as well. Okay? Now, each data point falls at a distance yi minus y bar from the mean value. Okay, I'm just measuring the distance for each data point, the distance from each data point to the mean value. Okay, it's yi minus y bar. Right? It's very nice to see it visually. Now, if I were to treat those yi minus y bar values as distances, right, I can sum all of them up and get a norm for those distances. And we're going to use a Pythagorean norm because it's going to be always positive. We're not going to worry about absolute values, etc. We can differentiate it, you know, without having also to worry about absolute values. So we always take a Pythagorean norm. In other words, the sum of those distances squared, that gives me an aggregate measure of all of the distances, okay, from each data point towards the mean. Okay. So now we are at that point, summation of yi minus y bar squared, that is the aggregate distance square, aggregate of the square distances to all, uh, of all the data points to the mean, okay. Now, it has units of y squared, right? So not units of the 
response variable. So in this case, it would be centimeter squared, right? Not centimeter. Okay. So now, I want you to try to use this to come up with an average distance of all the data. I want an average distance to the mean. So we have how many data points and data points, right? They're separated from the mean. We have the total aggregate distance, right? What is the average distance? Because it's a Pythagorean, you know, so we avoid negative and positive. Yeah. Okay. Well, if we wanted to find the distance, why not just take the absolute value of yi minus y and then sum those? And then because absolute values cause problems when you are doing differentiations with calculus. So we always prefer to do, that's a legitimate way of doing it. It's just not conducive to doing statistics mm -hmm. and with calculus. Same thing with the least square of the error. We could have taken the absolute value. Okay, if I have time at the end of the, this chapter, I'll spend some time on explaining why we choose the square of the error, for example, and the square of the distance. Okay? But there are legitimate reasons for why we choose the square. It's a great question. Okay? Um, but now suppose this is our aggregate distance. Now clearly this is in units of y squared, so centimeter squared. So I need to at least take the square root of this to bring this back to centimeter. But what is the average distance? What is the average distance? How did we calculate the average? We, we sum, summed all the values divided by n, right? So what would be the average distance in this case? Average distance. So if we take this summation and divide it by the number of points and take the square root, that should give us the average distance, right? Okay. However, we're wrong if we do that because in this case, the average distance is indeed this summation divided by the number of points, but minus one. Okay, I'll explain why in a second. And we take the square root. Now you agree that this has units of the response variable. So this was centimeter squared in this case. You take the square root, gives you centimeter. But why do we divide by n minus one rather than n? It's because when we used y bar, we already used the data to determine the mean value. So in a way, we lost one degree of freedom to determine that y bar. We already embedded that addition, one additional piece of information into y bar. So instead of doing n points, we do it over n minus one point. In statistics lingo, this is called an unbiased estimator. You can use n. It's not going to make a big, big difference, especially for large data sets. But n minus one is strictly the way how we define this. Okay. Now, do you know what that is? So this is the average distance of any data point with respect to the mean. Do you know what this formula stands for? This is the standard deviation. This is the formula of the standard deviation. It is the average distance that any data point in your data set is from the mean. It's the average distance from the mean. That's it. So in other words, when you say, the standard deviation in this case, let's say it's three centimeters. It means that on average, okay, one standard devi if, if a person has three centimeters um, taller than the average, they're within one standard devi deviation, excuse me. So for this data set, the standard deviation is actually 3.16 centimeters. We give the symbol SY for this thing. It's just simply the average distance of, all the da of any data point, the average distance from the mean. Now, the standard deviation, by definition, it measures the spread of the data around the mean value. So if you have a higher standard deviation, it means the data are more spread away from the mean value. If your standard deviation is small, it says that the data are more clustered around the mean. Okay, so now we started with a data set. You give me a mean value. You give me a standard deviation. I can tell you immediately whether those data are going to be clustered around the mean or f are going to be farther away from the mean. Okay, and that's important because that tells you how much the data is spread. Are they all clustered together or are they spread apart from each other? Okay. Now, this is statistics, not regression, but for a normal distribution, 68% of the data fall within 
standard within one standard deviation of the mean. So for a bell curve, 68% of your data falls within plus or minus one standard deviation. That's pretty powerful. Okay? And 95% of the data falls within two standard deviations. Okay? So when we are looking and doing statistics on exams and uh, measurements in medicine, etc., cetera, um, most data eventually tend to be to follow a normal distribution. So knowing this information helps us a lot. So if I know I have a normally distributed set of data and I know the standard deviation, I know that 68% of the people fall within that um, standard deviation. Okay? Now one note about this n minus 1, another note about this n minus 1. In some cases, you will see the standard deviation defined with n in the denominator, okay, instead of n minus 1. And maybe you learned that when you were taking, if you took statistics. However, in that formula, if you see n in the denominator, what you're going to see up there in the numerator, instead of y bar, you're going to see mu, or the mean of the population, not the sample. This y bar is only the mean of the sample that we have, the 10 data points that we collected, or the 40 data points that we collected, not the 300 million people, you know, for the entire population, okay? So when you are dealing with an entire population, then you divide by n, okay? Because then you are not using an average of the sample. Here, we had to define y bar from the sample we collected. It wasn't given to us from the population. Okay? Okay, question. Which plot has a higher standard deviation? The, the one to the left, right? This one, okay. The other one has smaller standard deviation. Yes, you, will be, you are correct. Because the data is spread farther away from the mean. Okay? Okay. Standard deviation, good. Standard error. So now we're going to take the same, we're going to do the same story, okay? But instead of talking about the mean, we're going to talk about the regression line or the regression curve. Again, consider the femur length and height data again um, with the straight line regression. This was the resulting curve that we did, the resulting straight line from regression, okay? And if you remember, this was our model, A1x plus A0. Now, the regression line, same story, okay? But instead of the mean now, we're replacing the word mean by a regression line. The regression line or curve, because we're going to apply this, this applies to any other regression model, not necessarily just a straight line. Linear or nonlinear regression, doesn't matter. Excuse me. The regression line divides the data with values above it and values below it. This is called the spread of the data around the regression curve. Just like we looked at the spread of the data around the mean, now we have the spread of the data around the regression curve. Okay, I'm trying to estimate how well my regression line is going to fit the data. Okay, that's what we're after here. Again, each data point falls at a distance of yi, which is the input value, minus fi, the model prediction. Okay, it falls uh, at that distance from the regression line, right? Just like we did for the mean. Now we're doing it with respect to the regression line. Okay, great. Next, I'm going to do the same thing. The aggregate distance of all points from the regression line, all we did was replace y bar by fi, okay, is the sum of yi minus fi squared. Again, a Pythagorean norm. Take the square of all of those distances, all right? So in a way, I'm trying to calculate the standard deviation of the data with respect to the regression line, okay? All right? So what is the next step? I want to compute an average distance from the regression line. Just like we did the average distance from the mean, we had the square root of this summation over n minus 1. Now do it for the regression line, okay? Get me the average distance of the data from the regression line. And think about how many points go in the denominator. Think about the regression line, 
how many parameters it has, what we use to, to, to derive those parameters, okay? Yeah, so this is the total distance squared, right? But I want the average distance now. So there's going to be a square root of this number over something. You have n data points. You don't need the, well, no, just fi. Just keep it fi. No, no. You know fi, okay? This is data that you know. Yes, but what about the denominator? Okay. So there's going to be a square root. Okay. Think about the denominator. Okay. Okay. I'll give you the answer. It's going to be the square root of this summation, yi minus fi squared. Okay, you, you probably got that. Who got the denominator? You're saying n minus, you got it, okay? Okay, do you guys care to, yes. like what your thinking process was? I thought we made two parameters for the lines for those two degrees. Okay, same thing. Okay, yes, I agree. Okay, so the reason that we put n minus two in the denominator this always baffles when you're studying statistics and regression. This is the most baffling point, and you will never understand that until you make peace with it at some point in your life. But here's one way to think about it. When we fit the straight line, this is specifically for a straight line regression. When we fit the straight line, we use the data to derive two parameters, A0 and A1. A0 and A1 were only dependent on the sum of xi and yi, right, and xi squared. So we already used the data twice. So we lost, to, to unbiase that, we're going to lose two, degree of free, two degrees of freedom from the data. It's easier to think about the mean value, okay, when we do y bar, is the summation of all data points, right, over n. Which means if you have n minus 1 data points, you can infer the last data points from knowledge of the mean, right? Because the mean is n y1 plus y2 plus y3 plus et cetera over n, okay? So if you know the mean and n minus 1 data points, you can always find the last data point from the mean, right? So you only, have, you only need n minus 1 data points. Same thing here with the straight line, okay? We use the data to predict two parameters, all right? Um, and so this is called the standard deviation for the regression curve. Some people will throw fits about calling it this way. No, this is not the standard deviation, etc. So they call it the standard error. Whatever, okay? Splitting hairs. It acts, it has the same meaning of what the standard deviation means for the mean value. The standard error has the same meaning for the regression line or the regression curve, it, it is on average the distance from the data to the regression curve, okay? So the standard error measures the spread of the data around the regression line, okay? For these R, this is plus one standard error and minus one, one standard error, okay, for the uh, straight line regression. And again, 68% of the data fall within a standard error of the model fit for a normal distribution. Okay, if the data is also normally distributed, 68% of the data fall within one standard error of the regression. Okay? Okay. Now you can think of the standard error as the standard deviation with respect to the regression line. Okay. Now in general, in general, for a regression model that has M parameters, a0, A1, A3, B, W, gamma, M parameters, M coefficients, your standard error calculation needs to take that into account. For every parameter that you did use, you're going to lose one degree of freedom. So your denominator becomes N, which is the number of data points, minus M, your number of parameters. Straight line, 
is going to be, you're going to lose two degrees of freedom. For a quadratic, you have three parameters, you're going to lose three degrees of freedom. It becomes n minus three and so on, okay? All right. Let's get back to our regression line. With this data now, we had the mean and the standard deviation now. The standard deviation was 3.16 centimeters in this case. When we fit the data, our standard error or the standard deviation with respect to the regression line is 1.43 centimeters. So think of it this way. If we were using the mean to describe the data, we were committing an error on average of 3.16 centimeters. Because the data on average was 3.16 centimeters away from the mean. When we put the straight line regression, our standard deviation changed to become 1.43 centimeters. So we have effectively reduced our representation of the data by using the regression line from 3.16 to 1.43. That's what we're headed, where we're headed to, okay? By using a better representation of the data, the mean was always the gold standard, but the regression line looks like it did better here, okay? It did better than using the mean to represent the data, so I'd rather use the regression line, yes? Yes, if the distribution is fundamentally normal. Yeah. yeah. No, no, this is not normal. This is, uh, that was a statistical fact. Connor. So on the equation, um, you don't, like, you don't find the distance necessarily between the point and the data. You just find the distance between the data point and its value, corresponding value on the... Yeah, on it's the not the normal distance. It's the vertical distance. Right. So yeah. on this, is that standard error... The distance That's what it looks like. Uh, no, it is, it is, yeah, it is that distance. It is that distance, yep. Because we took the square root, mm -hmm. right? So in a way, it took the two vectors and took the distance, okay? Good question. Okay, so now that's what I had. We kind of are convinced now that, in a way, we changed the standard deviation, okay? So that it's smaller now when we are using the regression curve. How do we quantify that? We introduce this idea of the R squared value. Who's heard of the R squared value? Heard of it? You've used it in Excel maybe to do a trend line, what they call a trend line, and spits out a R squared value. Do you understand what it means? <laughs> okay, I didn't understand either. Hopefully today you'll understand what it means. Okay, the standard deviation and the standard error can be combined together to assess how good a data fit is. I want you to follow carefully with me so that we can derive this because the math is gonna be very telling in this case. When we were looking at the mean to represent the data, we defined the standard deviation, which was this square root of the summation, etc. But out of that, I wanna go back to that aggregate distance, okay? Aggregate of the dis square of the distances, okay? I'm gonna call that ST. This is the magnitude of the error prior to regression with respect to the mean. Why am I calling that error? Because again, we treated the mean as the simplest representation of our data. Now, because the data do not fall on the mean, their distance from the mean, we're going to call that an error. Is it an error? No, it's an error only in the sense that if we use the mean to represent the data, the distance of the data from the mean is like an error, okay? So call that error, okay? And make me happy, okay? Be happy. All right. Now for the regression curve, we also had a similar concept and we defined the standard error. Now the numerator in that standard error refers to the magnitude of that distance or the error after regression with respect to the regression line. So ST represents the magnitude of the error prior to regression with respect to the mean. So we haven't done regression, we're only using the mean, the mean is the gold standard. Then we did regression, 
and we altered that distance. This is the new distance that we're committing on, on not on average, this is the new total error we're committing. That's the new total distance of the data from the regression curve, okay? So I'm gonna keep those up there in front of you, okay? Now here's the punchline. The difference between those two errors, the error with respect to the mean before regression and the error after regression with respect to the regression line, it means something, okay? And I want you to take a moment to think about this, really try to think about it, okay? What did we accomplish by putting a curve along the data? Did we reduce that error or did we increase it? Or did we keep it the same? Think about two situations. What if the error after regression is the same as the error before regression? What if the error after regression is lower than the error before regression with respect to the mean? Okay. So what, what does that difference quantify? It means something. Would the higher number mean a higher slope? Like a slope? Mm -mm. Okay. No, it strictly has to do with how far away the data are going to be from the line, from the curve. So think about two situations. SR is after regression, ST is before regression. SR is after regression, the spread of the data with respect to the regression curve. ST is the spread of the data with respect to the mean. Yes. Yes. Do you want to elaborate on that? Like, how did you conclude that? A spread, yeah. How did we improve on using the mean? Did our regression improve on using the mean? Okay. All right, so if SR and ST are the same, what that means is that using regression didn't improve our spread of the data. The spread of the data is the same as using the mean to represent the data. The spread of the data after regression, SR, if SR is the same as ST, it means the spread of the data after regression is the same as the spread of the data before regression with respect to the mean. So we might as well just use the mean to represent the data. We didn't do anything with regression. However, if SR is much smaller than ST, it means the spread of the data after regression with respect to the regression curve is smaller than the spread of the data before regression with respect to the mean. Well, that means that regression is good. It's a better representation of the data compared to just using the mean to represent the data, okay? The difference quantifies the improvement that the regression has made over just using a mean value to describe the data. Again, we always held the mean value as the gold standard, okay? And like I said, if SR and ST are about the same, then no improvement. If SR is much less than ST, this is what we want, this is what we hope to accomplish, then we've made significant improvements. Now, because these quantities are scale dependent, it's best to normalize by one of them. So we typically define, take this difference and divide it by ST, okay, the original um, error or the standard, the, st the standard deviation before we did regression. And when you take that difference divided by ST, that's your coefficient of determination or the R squared value. It characterizes the improvement that regression would have done to your data as compared to just using the mean to represent your data. One simplification is to when you divide by ST, separate the summation and the numerator, so you get one minus SR over ST. Now you look at the two extreme cases. If SR and ST are similar, then R squared is going to be 1 minus 1. It's going to be close to 0. Bad. Bad fit. Because SR is close to ST. We didn't improve our data spread. But if SR is much smaller than ST, then this guy approaches 0, and your R squared value counts closer to 1. Okay? Which means a good regression. So R squared approaches zero, bad fit, no improvement. 
over using the mean value to describe the data. R squared approaches one, perfect fit. Significant improvement over using the mean to describe the data. Okay, here's the data set. Without doing any calculations, like I promised you in the learning objectives, visually do the following. Visually draw a regression line, compare ST and SR, they're gonna be similar, and estimate the R squared value. Work in groups or individually? Uh, on your. So these are the types of questions you will get on exam three, okay? Or exam two, whatever we called it. Now everyone is. <laughs> Dry regression line. Compare SR and ST. Without knowing the numerical values, you should be able to tell if we improve the spread of the data or not. Okay? So that was one thing I was asking. Wouldn't a very low R squared value imply that the data is mostly flat? That means the mean is the best descriptor of the data. A higher R squared value, maximum is one, means you have a perfect fit. Yeah. It means you've shrunk your, rep your representation of the data. You see in the next example. Your representation of the data is, is better than using the mean to represent the data. Okay? This one? Well, thank you. Yes. Oh. Oh, okay. Let me, let me fix that. Okay, so what are you guys thinking? You took too many answers, Ethan, today. I feel bad. Ainsley? Did you raise your hand or not? No, that's okay. <laughs> Ian? First, let's draw the regression line. Yeah. yeah. So the regression line, there's not really one that's going to be a better fit than just the x axis, which is uh -huh. the average right now. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. So, I agree. If you actually do a regression on this one, it's just going to be a horizontal line. If you run the regression line, you get the formula minus 0.003x plus 0.058. So, essentially, that's just the, the x-axis, okay? It's barely tilted up, okay? You calculate the r-squared value, it's almost zero. So in other words, your regression line didn't do any improvement over using the mean value to represent the data. And you can see that visually, right? Because the data is all clustered horizontally around the mean value. You don't need regression in this case. It's useless. Just use the mean value. Then you sound really smart when you're talking something. Oh, you don't need regression for this. Just use the mean value, right? Okay. What about these data? Do the same thing. Okay, so the mean value is this black line, okay? Yeah, so draw the line, yeah, SR, SR is for regression. Yeah, for the, yes, yeah, yeah, R is for regression, yeah, yeah. T is for whatever, T-dian, 
T for TDN. <laughs> With respect to the mean and SR, R for regression. So, so R is the, aver is the aggregate distance after regression. Okay? So SR is the aggregate distance after regression with respect to the regression line. And ST is the aggregate distance before regression with respect to the mean. Okay? So let's see. <laughs> okay. Abigail. Okay, so let's start. You can answer all of them if you want. Um, which or whichever one you want. So let's draw the regression line. It's just going to go through all the points. Yeah, it's just going to be like this straight line along the points. Okay. Okay, what about ST and SR? Uh, so ST is going to be a lot bigger than SR because okay. it's deviation is greater for Yeah, so ST is the spread of the data with respect to the mean. If you look at the mean, which is this average black line, the data is spread significantly as you go out. From, ze you know, from zero to the kind of the center and then away, the data is spreading around the mean. But with respect to the regression line, we ex I mean, this is pretty much a straight line, all those data, right? They've been doctored <laughs> on purpose, right? So that regression line, the spread of the data around that straight line is going to be much smaller than that around the mean, which tells us that the R-squared value is going to be closer to one, because we have a near perfect fit, okay? Indeed, this is the regression line, 0.99x, okay? Almost exactly fitting the data with an R-squared value of 99.6%, okay? Now, from this number, you can tell that the data is doctored, okay? <laughs> so, I'm suspicious of, you know, experimental data where the data fit it has an R-squared value of like 99% or more. I personally doctored these data so to prove a point, right? So I created a straight line data and perturbed, the, perturbed them a little bit, okay? But that proves the point, okay? What's a good R-squared value? Some people are happy with 75%, okay? That's a large value, okay? It's a good value. Depends on your system too, okay? All right, so now... We're going to go back to our activity notebook, uh, which we were working with last time. And we're going to implement the mean, the standard deviation, the standard error, and compute the coefficient of determination. Okay? Unfortunately, none of those are available through NumPy um, or the other one we will learn later in this, in this chapter, which is curve fit. So you always have to compute those manually. You can use the formulas we, we implement in class in this notebook, okay? So go ahead and pull up the notebook we worked with last time. Yep, that same notebook. Now the formulas, I, I can't put the slides up here, but the formulas are over here, okay? We're gonna start by computing the standard deviation which is the square root of y, sum of yi minus y bar squared over n minus 1, all right? First, we need y bar, which is the sample average value or the sample mean, okay? So give it a shot. Let me remind you that, so if you haven't executed the data set, go ahead and execute it again, the notebook, so that you put everything in memory, okay? Okay, so for the mean value, I need n, the number of data points, and remember n is len of xi or yi, okay? y bar, the mean value, is the summation of yi over n, okay? Remember mp.sum, 
So we could do mp.sum of yi, which is our yi data over n. So that gives us y bar. Now st is this guy, summation of yi minus y bar squared. So again, I have an np.sum dot sum of yi minus y bar squared. So I'm going to put it in a square. OK? And finally, sy, the standard deviation, is mp dot square root of st over n minus 1. OK? It gives me 3.49 centimeters. standard deviation. Good. Some advanced statistics libraries in Python will probably return all of this information for you. Um, but I think they add more complexity to the class, to, in this class. You'll probably encounter those in the next few years. Use them. Right? But I like simplicity. Go ahead, Jeff. No, ST is wrong. It's YI minus Y bar. Yeah. Okay. Now let's go to the standard error. It's a similar problem. Okay, similar calculation. However, we have this fi over here, which are the model predictions at the input values. Okay, those are the model predictions at the input values. Okay, now remember last time I told you to always implement your y model as a Python subroutine. So that's your fi. So if, if we evaluate this y model at the xi values, that's going to return to us all the fi values. It's just an array. OK? Let's do that. So fi is simply my y model at xi. Now sr is mp dot sum of yi minus fi squared. And the standard error, the symbol for that is sy given x, is mp dot square root of sr over n minus 2. And you get 1.43 centimeters. Now that you have SR and ST and um, all the data you got, you can compute the R squared value. Okay? And in this case, I can already have everything that I need. So I don't need Y bar and FI over here. I can compute the R squared, which is 1 minus S, um, R over ST, right? So if you um, go back up here, right? 1 minus SR, the aggregate distance with respect to the regression line, over ST with respect to the mean, OK? And you compute the R squared value, well, in this case, giving us 85%, OK? Because I had a little bit different data points than on the slides, OK? But that's a decent value. Now, in practice, what I would do, I create a function called coefficient of determination, or R squared. And inside it, I compute all of those quantities. Okay? I pass the model, and I compute all those quantities. We'll have a chance to show you how I do this with another data set. Okay? If you don't have any questions, you can take a three-minute break. Okay? We'll resume.
With the what? Y model. And it looks like you had a different. Y no, model. you can't. Uh, you ca this is the carrot is not oh. the symbol for the power. It's a yeah. It's a. It's yeah. Yeah yeah. It's an X or. <laughs> Yeah, the, and the, how I knew this, um, Brandon, is if you look at the warning, it was pointing to SR, not FI. If it were pointing to FI, then it would have been my, the Y model. I thought it might be the model because it was pulling FI. It would have caught it up, up there, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's start with the y bar value. Okay, it's harder to do it to explain it with the straight line. Okay, but with the mean value, it's easy to explain. So let's say you have three data points y1, y2, and y3, right? The mean value is equal to y1 plus y2 plus y3 over 3. Agreed? Okay. Okay, three data points. Correct. Now, if I were to give you y bar and y1 and y2 would you be able to deduce y3 absolutely yeah. right because it's 3 y bar minus y1 minus y2 yeah. right or if i give you y bar and y2 and y3 you'll be able you can deduce y3 here here you can deduce y1 and if i give you y bar and y1 and y3 you'd be able to deduce y2 so in other words we only have, we lost, we can deduce one data point given y bar. So we lost one of the data points, right? It's not exactly, because it's embedded in y bar, right? So given y bar, now, you know, you have y mi yi minus y bar squared. Your actual number of data points is n minus 1 because you already, use, you already deduce 1 from y bar. Okay. Whoa. Now when you go to the straight line, right? yeah, well, it's a little bit more, more than that. It's not that you can predict the data point exactly from A0 and A1, but to deduce A0 and A1, you used all the information from your data. So in a way, you embedded that you used the data twice. So to be fair, you have to knock out two degrees of freedom out of those data. But it's best explained with the Y bar because you can, yeah, you can deduce. Exactly. It's not a degree of freedom anymore because you can either use these three data points or these three data points. Okay? And you already used this one and you're using these guys, so you go N minus one, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Another hello? Sweet. And have a good day now. Have a good day. Was that you? Yeah. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Doctor Hey, please. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, the plot, like do the plot. The yeah, yeah, right. that's it. Yep, that's, that's yes, BNC. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hey, it's all, uh, you over provide information if you're in doubt, but yeah, this is, this kind of sufficient. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Okay, so next we are going to talk about other model curves. We're going to spend the rest of the chapter 
Now we have enough tools to assess how good a regression is, you know, with the standard error and the coefficient of determination. Now we're going to start looking actually at different models for regression, okay? And we're going to start by extending what we did so far for a straight line and do it for a polynomial. And I call that regression to a polynomial model. And again, I'm going to try to enforce the idea that when I say linear regression, it's not regression to a straight line. If I'm regressing to a straight line, I'll say regression to a straight line, regression to a polynomial. Because what we mean in this class, what we mean by linear regression is that the normal equations are linear. Okay? The normal equations are linear. Okay. So now suppose, for some reason, you think your data is best modeled by a quadratic. A2x squared plus A1x plus A0. Again, this is not interpolation. You don't have three data points, and you want to pass this through those three data points. You might have a thousand data points, and you, wanna, you think the trend is quadratic. Now, do you think we will get a system of linear equations if we do regression for this? And I kind of already answered that, but yes, why? Why? <laughs> Yes, yes, indeed. Just like when we, what we did with interpolation, our coefficients, our parameters in red here, on purpose in red, they show up linearly. They're not under a transcendental function or something complicated where we cannot separate them from the independent variables, right? So, yeah, I do expect to get a linear system of equations that governs A0, A1, and A2. The system that governs those equations, those parameters, is called the normal equations, okay? So yes, there's a big yes over here, okay? All right, so let's go ahead and do this. It's gonna, we're going to go faster now. If you're stuck on the math, work through it at home, okay? It's just standard derivatives, all right? So again, our model is A2x squared plus A1x plus A0. We define the sum of the errors like we did for the straight line. It's the same formula. Now, we plug in fi into that formula, so we get inside that summation, we get the a2s and a1s and a0s, and then s is minimum if and only if the partial derivatives of s with respect to our parameters in red. Always think, where are your unknowns? The xi and the yi are given data to you. What we don't know here are a0, a1, and a2. So we differentiate S with respect to A0, A1, and A2. And if we set that equal to zero, that is going to be a guarantee that S is going to be a minimum. Okay? And those are the normal equations. Okay? So you do this. You carry out the calculation like we did last time. Okay? Now you have three equations and three unknowns. Yeah, the summation, etc. it's all scary. It's just a summation. It's going to end up with a, num a single number. Now, you segregate that into a system of equations. Again, these are the normal equations, but you put all the terms that have the coefficients or the unknowns on the left, which are A0, A1, A2, and I kind of stack them like this so that nice and clean I can see the coefficient matrix. And the right-hand side, you move everything you know to the right-hand side, and you get a nice system of equations. Okay? That is a superset of the system that we obtained for a straight line. For a straight line, we had only n, some xi, and some xi, some xi squared. When we added one more term to the polynomial, we got one extra column and one extra row. Okay? But now we go all the way to some xi to the 4. Okay? We know how to solve this. NumPy.LinAlgebra.Solve. Give us a0, a1, a2, plug them in a model fit, and you're good to go. Okay? And from that, you can also calculate the coefficient of determination and the standard error and all of that stuff. Now, the same applies for regression to any high-order polynomial. Why do we always talk about polynomials? Because they're kind of the simplest to think about. And there's a theorem in math that says that the real space or the function space is dense in polynomials. You can almost always find a polynomial to approximate any function. That's really what the Taylor series is telling you, right? So we like polynomials, but 
they're not always the best. However, we just cover that. So if you do the same procedure for a polynomial of order m, now notice the polynomial has order m, so we have m parameters. So in the standard error, we, in the denominator, we have n minus m. But we have n data points. This is what you get. Yes, very interesting. Okay. Excuse me. So you have n... So you have n data points, but your polynomial power is m. So you get this summation xi to the power m plus m, okay, at the bottom, down there, in that corner. And you can build that system of equations annoyingly, okay? We're going fi to figure out a way to do it a little bit faster. Um, but this is what you get with these polynomials, you know, and... We rarely are going to do a regression to anything more than a quadratic, frankly. The interesting regression models are actually going to be sinusoidal or nonlinear. Okay? And at most, I've seen things that we've dealt with, like two or three parameters. Okay? However, when you get to machine learning, you might be doing regression on hundreds or thousands of parameters. Okay? And the methods we've described here the normal equations are not efficient anymore, okay? But that's a discussion for the machine learning session later, okay? Okay. Now, with that, I'm going to generalize this even further. What if I don't want polynomials? What if we want sines and cosines and logarithms and exponentials, okay? Call that general linear regression. And I give this definition again. In this class, every time I say linear regression, I do not mean regression to a straight line. When I'm regressing to a straight line, I will tell you regression to a straight line. Okay? Linear regression means that the least square system of equations or the normal equations that governs the coefficients of the model curve is linear. That's all we mean by linear regression. So all polynomial regression or regression to a polynomial the way we, sh we saw them, they are all linear regression from that perspective, okay? It's a regression to a polynomial. The polynomial is nonlinear, sure, in X, but as far as regression is concerned, you're still solving a linear system of equations. In that sense, polynomial regression and other models, when the coefficients show up linearly, are all types of linear regression. To be clear, in our discussions, we will use words like regression to a straight line, regression to a quadratic, regression to a sinusoidal form. Okay? That is, I think, less ambiguous. Okay? All right. So what if now, I'm going to start with a polynomial variation. What if your model does not follow a standard polynomial form, like A plus BX cubed? Okay? Mm-hmm. That used to be a trick question on previous exams um, because you can't put zeros in the matrix. You have to kind of pull out the correct rows and columns. The best way is to actually rederive the system of equations. That's what, we, that's what we're going to do here, okay? Now I'm going to ask you a series of questions to actually by hand work on obtaining the normal equations by minimizing the, um, the sum of the squares or doing the least squares. So now our model is a plus bx cubed. My unknowns are a and b, okay? So go ahead and derive the normal equations for this system. The normal equations are those two, right? ds by dA equals zero and ds by dB equals zero. Okay, so spend a minute, go do derivation by hand. These are classic questions for the exam, okay? I can come up with a thousand variations on this question, so you better work this, these muscles quite well, okay? Just find the governing equations for A and B. And I want to make it tedious on purpose, okay? Because I want to get to a point where we can do this very fast, okay? Just don't even write them in matrix form. 
just find the two, these two equations, the normal equations, okay? That's your model. This is the sum that we're minimizing. Differentiate with respect to A and with respect to B. Don't forget the summations. The derivative of u to the power n is n u prime u n minus 1, okay? n u prime u n minus 1, u to the n minus 1. Yeah, where are the summations? summations. Yeah, and x i and, and yeah. Do I just write the summation here? Mm-hmm. Okay, okay, and x i, don't forget the x i's. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Now it's right. Yes, I think so. X I Q. I think so. Uh, well, no, you're not going to have a square anymore. Oh, that's right. Right? That's right. Yeah. yeah. You're not going to have a square anymore. Okay, I'll give you another 30 seconds or one minute to get this through. Try to work it out. If you're stuck, let me know. I'll help you now. Yeah, don't worry about that. I'm just trying to prove a point that this is annoying and tedious and I don't want to do it anymore, okay? <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and same, same for this one, right? Yeah. yeah, you don't have to worry about simplifying, just, yeah. Um, it depends, it depends. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, no, yeah, in the, as you simplify. Okay, so without any simplification, this is what you would get. That's a standard differentiation of this with respect to A, with respect to B. So with respect to A, you're going to get 2 times 1, right, times u to the power n minus 1. And with respect to B, when you differentiate this with respect to B, you're going to pick up xi cubed, right? So you get this one over here. Then you go ahead and simplify these equations and you get this system of equations. Again, these are the normal equations for this model. Okay, great. The point now is to show you how tedious and annoying this is. All right, let's keep it more annoying. So now suppose you want to fit data that looks like this. This is an actual regression line on those data, okay? Now this model looks like it's a sinusoidal model. A cosine t plus B sine t for these data. Is this model linear? No. Oh, oh, yes. 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 yes, because what's, what's shown in red shows up linearly. Okay? So, yes, we do expect that regression in this case is going to result in a system of linear equations. If not, if you're in doubt, derive it. So now we have, if you're in doubt, print it out, plot it, and derive it, right? Okay. So if you are confused about it, go ahead and derive it, which is what you're going to do right now. Okay, go ahead and do the, do the tedious work of deriving this. Okay? Go ahead, do it. Exercise those muscles with respect to A and respect to B. When you differentiate with respect to A, everything else is constant. When you differentiate with respect to B, everything else is constant. Do not get confused by sine t and cosine t. Those are there to trick you and mess with you. Again, S is minimum when these conditions are satisfied, and those are the normal equations.
So in, y, in place of fi, put a cosine ti plus b sine ti, right? So, yeah, don't forget T i, right? Yeah, and cosine T i. Don't forget that when you apply your model to a data point, T and X and whatever independent variable, they become T i and X i, okay? They're not variables anymore. They are input data points. I hope you're finding this annoying and tedious. That's the point, okay? That's the point. It is annoying. Who thinks it's annoying and tedious? Okay, for those of you who don't think it's annoying and tedious, let's do more. No. <laughs> okay, so you do this one, and et cetera, et cetera, you rearrange, and that same old story again and again, and you get a system of equations that looks like this. It's a linear system of equations. You have these combinations of sine and cosine, right, which are your basis functions in the model. Oh, we introduced a word called basis functions, which we learned about. Okay, that's great. Good, good point. So what about now you have to add an exponential over there? I'm not going to let you do it, but it's annoying as heck, okay? And I find it very annoying to have to derive those and put them on the slide. So I had to do this by hand and it was annoying. But it's to prove a point, right? That this is tedious. If every time you have a linear regression model and you're going to go ahead and derive these Normal equations by differentiating that annoying summation, uh, you know, come on, mathematicians, come up with something better. Luckily, there's something much, much easier that works so well for linear regression. It's going to take us some time to describe it, okay? And I'm going to describe it to you, okay? But first, okay, first we need to introduce the idea of basis functions, but hey, we introduced them in interpolation, right? So what's a basis function? It's an elementary function that you can combine it with other elementary functions to come up with a complicated model, right? So in our case, as long as our parameters or coefficients show up linearly in front of those elementary functions, we always have linear regression, okay? These are exactly the same slides that I showed you in interpolation. Remember, what were the basis functions for all of those models? For a plus bx, it was 1 plus x. For a0 plus a1x plus a2x squared, it was 1x x cubed, et cetera, right? The basis functions, we did this exact same exercise, um, this exact same exercise uh, when we did interpolation. Okay, I have seven minutes. I'm not sure I can cover all of this, but I'll try and we'll come back, we'll revisit it after, after spring break. So now I'm gonna, I want to do regression for an arbitrary set of basis functions, okay? But first, I want to show the example only with two basis functions. I found this on the web. Okay. <laughs> Parameters A and B, shown in red, those are the unknowns. This is a linear regression model. And my basis functions are phi of x and psi of x. So this could be sine x, exponential x, right? Whatever. Some arbitrary basis function. And I'm doing it with two just to prove the point, okay? Now the system of equations for least squares regression for this model, again, you go through the annoying derivation, okay? This is what you get. Some phi i phi i. If you remember our basis functions when we had one and x, right? This was sum of one, right? And then sum of x, sum of x, and sum of x squared, right? if you remember that straight line model. Anyway, this is the system of equations for this regression model. C and C are basis functions. What I'm going to show next is what looks like a trick or cheating with math, okay? But there's over 30 slides of derivations for how to prove this. I'm not going to prove it. I'm just going to show you the result, okay? It's very tedious to prove it. But this is the best, how, the best way to describe it and how to simplify it. Okay. 
Now, if I rewrite this as the following product of matrices, or matrices and vectors. If I take this matrix here, which is 2 by n, right? So you have two rows and n columns. In the first row, you have the first basis function. And in the second row, you have the second basis functions, but applied at each observation. This is first observation, second observation, and so on. And multiply it by my y vector. That, if you do that product, that results in what I have up there. Do you agree? Right? Phi 1 times y1 plus phi 2 times y2 plus phi n times yn. That's the first entry up there. Right? For the second entry, c1 times y1 plus c2 times y2 plus etc. cn times yn. That's the second entry. Right? So 2 by n times n by 1 is going to give you a 2 by 1 matrix or vector. Okay? Okay, good. Now, what about this one? Same thing, that coefficient matrix that governs my normal equations can also be written in this way. It's actually just the product of this guy and its transpose, or this guy and its transpose. Right? So think about it. The first entry up there, some phi i, phi i, this is the product of this row by this column, right? So phi 1 times phi 1 plus phi 2 times phi 2 plus phi 3 times phi 3, all the way phi n times phi n. Here's what I found. The second entry is this row times this column or the dot product, right? It's phi i times psi i, summation. Same thing for the lower left entry. It's this row by this column. And finally, those last two, the, this last row and the last column, right? So it gives you that last entry. So you agree that this product gives you that coefficient matrix, and this product gives you that right-hand side, OK? Now, this matrix is very special because it contains, in the first row, in the first column, it contains the first basis function. And in the second column, it contains the second basis function of our model. Remember, our model was A phi plus B times Psi, right? This replicates my model, A phi plus B times Psi, right? But then each row in this matrix corresponds to one of the observations in our data set. The first row is those basis functions evaluated at the first observation, phi1 and psi1. The second row are the basis functions at the second observation, and so on all the way to the nth observation. Okay. Now, if I call this matrix A and this vector Y, then this is nothing more than A transpose multiplied by A, and this is nothing more than A transpose multiplied by Y. There's a punchline here in that all you need to know to build a regression model or this regression model is the matrix A. And that matrix A didn't need any differentiation, didn't need any derivations, didn't need any reorganization of the unknowns or the known values. All you needed for the matrix A is to know your basis functions. Agreed? Phi and Psi, and just repeat, Phi 1, Psi 1, Phi 2, Psi 2, Phi 3, Psi 3, etc. This matrix is very special. The word normal equations comes from this system because A is normal, this system is normal to what we call the range of A, okay? Whatever that means. But that's where that nomenclature comes from. These are the normal equations. And in this class, we are going to call A, the special matrix, the regression matrix. Now, this methodology works for an arbitrary system of basis functions. I showed the example with phi and psi, but you could have phi 1 or phi and psi and g and f and whatever. All you have to do is stack them next to each other, build the matrix A, and that's it. You have your system of equations without having to differentiate, without having to build the summation of squares or any of that. I'm out of time, okay, so I want to let you go, but 
That's all we need when you come back from spring break. We'll remember this lecture, okay? And I'll show you that all you need are the basis functions, okay? Enjoy your spring break. <laughs>